um, as a part of that course, we had to uh, to read the the Buddha's supposed first sutta, which was um, which is the first sutta where he introduces this idea of the four noble truths or tasks or understandings, and I was kind of um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'll read the bit out perhaps in a minute. But I was interested in the fact that before the Buddha did speak about the four noble truths or the four tasks, or I like to think of them as four understandings, um, before he talked about that, he, he kind of introduced his discovery as being the middle way. And that kind of struck me. That's often glossed over. And the more I looked into it, the more I thought, you know, I think the Buddha's trying to get us to look at his so-called four truths through a different paradigm, through a different way of looking. And that's why he started by introducing the idea of the middle way. So for me, it was really asking us to go through a paradigm shift or asking the people who he was speaking to, to go through a big paradigm shift. And he was speaking to ascetics. He was speaking to five kind of sages who are really into, um, uh, you know, going through those ascetic practices of not eating much, um, not wearing much, you know, really taking life to the extremes. So uh, to me, it was important that he introduced the idea of a middle way and, and, um, and it has really affected my practice. So I guess that's why I'm talking to you about it. Now, um, when, it depends on what translation you read, of course, of this. But um, I was interested in uh, Stephen Batchelor's translation of um, the word the Buddha used that's often translated as extremes. Um, Stephen translated as a dead end. It's an extreme. It's somewhere where you can go no further. Uh, you can't learn anymore. It's no longer um, interesting or a point of learning or understanding. So um, I'll just read you um, uh, Stephen's translation, but it's very similar to other people's translations. And uh, you'll probably see what I mean, why I was quite interested in it. Um, and this is the way it goes. And I don't know if you're familiar with suitors, but you know, it's a different language to what we're used to. There are monks, two dead ends, which should not be pursued by one who has gone forth. Which two? Addiction to pleasure through indulging in sensuality, which is low village life pertaining to the unawake person, undignified and unfulfilling and the addiction to self-punishment, which is painful, undignified, and unfulfilling. The middle way, monks, awakened to by the Tathagata, does not lead to these two dead ends, but makes for vision and knowledge and is conducive to calming, lucid understanding, awakening, and nirvana. And what, monks, is this middle way? It's just this noble eightfold path. That is, right vision, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So, um, you know, I think the Buddha is, um, like I say, asking us to go through a paradigm shift before we think about his, um, the tasks that are pivotal to his approach. And in a sense, he's saying his teachings are the middle way, which is really ethics, the Eightfold Path. So again, I think um, to me what the Buddha is giving is not some kind of esoteric teaching, but is talking about ethics. Um, now, we can see that a whole sense of um, keeping away from extremes, he's saying one extreme is indulgence and the other extreme is self-punishment. So too much, not enough. And his, his way is somehow finding, you know, bouncing maybe from each extreme or each dead end and finding a middle way. Now, 
that was very different to the way people thought at his time. He was talking to ascetics who were really big on extremes. And um, the Brahmanical way of thinking was really around um, transcendence, you know, working very, very hard to get to here. And of course, um, a large part of our culture is around um, big effort is big results, okay? Good, better, best. Our language is even oriented around this. Um, goal orientation, you know, you have a goal and you go for it. Um, and truths, you know, finding truths and things that are kind of rigid or as I like the way Stephen puts it, they're kind of dead ends. Once you get there, there's nowhere else to go. So, um, again, I was interested in this because a lot of teachers that I've been with really push goals and maximum effort is maximum results. So, um, I've explored this after reading this. I explored it about especially what it means for my practice. Now, um, some of you might be interested, uh, might be familiar with um, that whole, I don't know if it's a myth or not, but that whole story around the Buddha and the middle way, um, where he was sitting on um, the edge of a river and a, he was starving himself. He was living the life of a mendicant. He was starving himself. He was not moving. He was um, going through all the kind of privations of, of that kind of life. And a boat floated down the river with a teacher uh, teaching a student about how to play a lute. And he said, if you have the string too tight, the sound is, is, is terrible. And if you have the string too loose, the sound is terrible. So your job as a musician is to find the middle way between that dead end and that. And um, when the Buddha heard that, a kind of a light went on and he realised that this practising of an extreme was a dead end. It was not useful for what he was aiming for. So, um, so I want you to hold that image, that sense of, of, of tuning um, a string and that, you know, our belief that, you know, lots of effort brings lots of results just doesn't work with, with a guitar string. Um, now, I'm just going to take a little bit of time to talk about language around this because um, I think the Buddha was very aware of language and how language often puts you in a dead end. It often stops you from exploring. And, you know, the nature of language is one word is dobbed on one concept and it often prevents us from looking either side. So... Um, that whole idea that you know thoughts and concepts make language it's also the other way around Lang Oops. Hmm. Oops. Uh, and there's there's lots of exam examples of this but um i think the big example for me as a child was the goodies and the baddies. You know, whenever we played uh, cowboys and Indians, there were goodies or baddies. There weren't ever anyone in between. <laughs> and um, our language really tends to, to, to do that. You know, it, it, things are either right or wrong or good or bad. Or the example I gave in my blurb, you know, at Christmas time, have you been naughty or have you been nice? And there's little emphasis on the language in between. So being brought up with this language often makes us uh, or encourages us to think in, in terms of these dualities. And um, often this kind of thwarts our practice, I think. Um, and I, there's a lot of examples where the Buddha challenged this. He, he took up words and um, gave them meaning himself. He took up words like dukkha, which we've translated as, as suffering, but he really played around with it. He gave lots of examples about what he meant by dukkha. And, you know, originally it meant the hub of a wheel. He took the word, I don't know, uh, sati, he took the, 
the word uh, sankaras and, and gave them new meaning and was quite flexible with those meanings. Um, I mean, even the idea, even the word kind of nibbana or enlightenment, he, he didn't stick to one word, he used many. So I think he was trying to avoid that, that kind of um, what I think of as a dead end of overuse of a word. Um, as a school teacher, I used to see this often, you know, often I, I used to teach six year olds. And I remember a little boy came once and told me that he was a naughty boy and, um, and then proceeded to be a naughty boy. It was like there was no option. So, you know, that use of that word had kept him within um, a certain framework. And, um, you know, again, there are many exa examples of this, but uh, I used to introduce the word ish to my kids. So instead of saying, oh, I'm slow at running, you could just say, well, I'm slow ish, you know, so that you can sort of allow for the fact that there's, it's a spectrum, not hard and fast. Again, you know, this sense of the middle way being between extremes. And so, you know, a kid would say, oh, my friend is mean. I'd say, mean-ish. You know, there are times when she's not mean and there are times when, you know, she's really kind. But by using the word mean, it's kind of limiting. So just a little story to, <laughs> to introduce the idea of ish that you might, uh, you might want to uh, use yourself when you're scolding yourself for not being patient or not be kind, you can, uh, you can throw in ish and it gives you a bit more of a spectrum. Mm. Um, and, you know, this, this can extend to your own practice. You know, I can remember uh, at, at Thich Nhat Hanh's community meeting a monk who was really kind of scolding himself for being, not being mindful. He'd kind of um, limited himself by thinking this is mindful and this is not mindful. And, and, and just um, that flexibility that I think the Buddha's talking about in the middle way means that, that we, we start to be aware that there's a whole spectrum, not just um, the good, the bad, the right and wrong, but you know, sometimes you're more mindful than others and, and that's okay. Um, okay, so let's have a look at this middle way because I think it's asking us to take a big shift in the way we look at things. And, and sometimes it's, it's hard to change. <laughs> um, you know, I'm myself, you know, I've always thought of big effort means big results. So this has had an impact on my practice too. But I think a lot of um, what the Buddha introduced at that time was very, very different to the philosophy of his time. So he was having to be very careful. And, um, a part of this middle way was um, what we think of as conditionality or what the Buddha called dependent arising. Okay, so dependent arising very much fits into this middle way idea in that everything, everything, meaning there's not a beginning or an end, has certain causes and certain conditions that maintain it. And when those causes uh, finish, they cease then uh, whatever it's bringing about ceases. So there's this whole sense of a kind of a coming and going or a fluidity of things depending on causes and conditions. Not that pyramid of here's the creator and this is what has been created or that something exists on its own. Um, there's more of this sense of a kind of a, a fluid, unpredictable, um, uh, flow of life as opposed to a lot of piles of existences. He And this goes into the Buddha's idea of emptiness. Um, again, it's a word that sort of frightens a lot of people, but really it just clicks into that um, causality or dependent arising of things don't have an essence um, in themselves. So there's not such a thing as this. Again, we can see the whole middle way here. There's not such a thing as that. It's more of a flow between the two extremes. And, and that's what all the Buddha meant by emptiness, is that nothing exists in and of itself with a pure essence. It's more of a, um, a flow of causes and conditions. And then 
of course, the middle way, which again feeds into this idea of, um, of things aren't a noun, they're a verb. They're a process, not a tangible thing. So you can see all these words that we think of when we think of Buddhism are actually kind of um, tapping into the similar thing, which I'm now thinking of as the middle way. So um, we, as we start to grasp this and kind of shift our paradigm, we can see that it really helps us live with a really um, unpredictable, ambiguous, non-dualistic life that, um, that just isn't stable. You know? but, but the more we can kind of click in with that and go with it, the less trouble we have. It's like we're in sync. Yeah. Um, okay, so the Buddha didn't just talk about the middle way in terms of, um, of this uh, kind of having too much of something or too less of something. He, he spoke about it a lot in terms of existence. Uh, and there's a sutta where he speaks to uh, Katyayana, I think, and where he says, um, you know, again middle way things don't exist and they don't not exist um and uh i mean i was going to read it to you but you know you, you probably get the idea so even um existence and the land the, the buddha had a, a way of putting this which he, he and again in his time the question about what exists and what doesn't exist was the question of the day. The fact that he challenged that made him pretty radical and made it, I think, very difficult for a lot of people who, who, who followed him to kind of grasp. So he said, it's not useful to think like this, to think this exists. And it's not useful to think it doesn't exist. And it's not useful to think that it both exists and doesn't exist. And it's not useful to think of that it neither exists nor not exists. So uh, he's trying to introduce the idea that kind of trying to fix something just isn't useful. Um, and again, we'll talk later about the implications on this for practice, because at the time people must have, well, did say to him, like, huh? <laughs> so what are we supposed to do then? You know. Um, a person or a sage, I suppose, or a student that really took up this idea of the Buddhas was a man called Nagarjuna or Nagarjuna. I'm not sure if um, any of you have heard of him, but um, I really recommend reading about him because uh, he, he was around in about the second century AD or after Christianity. And he wrote a lot of um, poems, verses, etc., around the middle way. He really got it. And he got that you can't talk about it because it's, it's really something that you have to get. It's like I said, a paradigm shift. So he wrote in verse, sensible. If you write in poetry, you don't risk being you know, too meticulous with your words. And he was a great logician. And he wrote a lot of kind of poetry and verses, not talking about em emptiness, but playing around, or, or the middle way or conditionality, but playing around with how it affects our life. And um, there's a, um, I've got it here. I suppose it's back to front to you guys. It's called Verses from the Centre and Stephen Batchelor uh, wrote a preamble for it. And he translated a lot of Nagajina's um, uh, well, of his um, written works. So if you're interested in, in pursuing that, I recommend it. In fact, maybe I'll read some because it's always good to read poetry in the middle of a Dharma talk. Um, uh, and again, the, um, he's playing around with, as opposed to telling us um, the implications of this whole idea of the middle way and emptiness, etc. So my favourite, oh, okay. So this is one that um, Tsongkhapa, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Tibetan teachers, but when Tsongkhapa uh, heard this, 
he immediately a light went on for him and he became also quite a famous uh, Buddhist teachers within the Mahayana tradition. Were mind and matter me, I would come and go like them. If I was something else, then they would say nothing about me. And then when Tsongkhapa heard that, he kind of got it. <laughs> Didn't have the same effect on me. I had to read it about 10 times. <laughs> um, and there's other ones here. Um, okay, so he played around with the idea of um, where things begin and where they end. Again, you can see that as a middle. This is where it is. This is where it isn't. And it's a whole spectrum that we're playing around with. Seeds turn into plants that bear fruit. Motives turn into mind, minds that bear fruit. Seeds are neither severed from nor forever fused with fruits of plants. Motives are neither severed from nor forever fused with fruits of the mind. Okay. And this is my favourite just because it really emphasises um, you know, sexuality. Past, present, future are just like bottom, middle and top and one, two, three. So again, he's, he's taking an emphasis off uh, the whole present thing. Hmm. Anyway, I won't keep going, but I recommend Nagarjuna, especially with Stephen Batchelor's uh, translation. And Nagarjuna himself says that um, dependent arising is emptiness, which is the middle way. So um, again, it kind of gives that feel of the Buddha as not being into doctrine and not being into kind of rigidity. Okay, so let's go back to the Buddha's example where he says not to pursue extremes. That uh, with dead ends, there's nowhere to go. There's no learning. There's no understanding. There's no exploring your experience. You've, you've just reached an, an end. So he, as I've said, has talked about it in terms of going without or having too much, the existence, non-existence, the being very flexible, very flexible and very fluid, but also bearing in mind there are times when you need to be to be rigid and stand fast. So again, life is, is moving between these two extremes. Being an optimist and a pessimist, something that is really useful and something that's not useful. Again, I see practice as really exploring um, these places. So it's very well, it's, well and good saying our practice is to explore the kind of spectrum between these um, these extremes. So, you know, I've started to think of practice as being like, a little bit like calibrating, or um, instead of kind of scolding yourself for not being mindful or not being in the present or not being whatever, practice is more of a kind of a knowing when you are and knowing when you aren't, and exploring more of a refining or a calibrating process. Um, and my image and, um, is of, of a buffalo, of taking a buffalo to market. So I often say to people in my groups, you know, allow yourself to wander. You know, you're moving towards the, towards the marketplace. You're um, the, the, uh, the boy who's driving you. Uh, if you if you move into the river and start getting lost in the river, then you get a little tap on the nose and you move back to the path, which is easier going. Then you might wander looking for grass onto the rocks, which is harder going, and the cow herd uh, gives you a little tap on the nose and you move back here. So the only way you really know where the path is, is by that little bit of help from the cow herd, little bit of experience of, oh, here's the river, here's the rocks, Here's the cliff, here's the um, mud, and really, you know, working your way towards the marketplace on this kind of process between dead ends or between extremes. So, um, how do we do this? Like, what's our barometer? How do we know what's kind of right? 
and even thinking about what's right, I don't think it's useful. But, um, you know, I really think in the Buddhist practice, there's a whole sense of harm. So if you go somewhere, and, and when he was talking to his son, that's how he framed it too, that if you hurt yourself and hurt others, and that can be quite subtle, then you know you're going to the wrong place. Okay, so so we can we can start to use our moderating process around harm or hurt, uh, or another one is really around um, understanding and ignorance. So if you're moving in a direction that is kind of blocking you or clouding you or preventing understanding, then you know that that's a little bit close to the rocky part, and uh, and the other side. So I guess in, in the Buddha Dharma, we, we're moving towards non-harm and we are moving towards um, uh, insight and understanding and wisdom. And we can think of non-harm as, as kindness. So I would say the barometers are kind of kindness and, and understanding and wisdom. Um, this also means that we have to train our sensitivity so we can pick up the subtle sense of, oh, I'm off the path, or oh, this is bringing about harm. So it involves training those sensitivities, training a kind of an aware mind, a sensitive mind, and this might not always be mindfulness, it might be concentration. Again, we can have mindfulness and concentration as the two kind of poles of a path that we're experimenting in. but but slowly over time increasing our sensitivities or our awareness and then the other part of it is really learning from our mistakes a little bit like that image of the cow on the path of really getting a sense of um, mistakes aren't actually bad i used to say that to the kids in my start in my class you know we love mistakes because then we know you know that's where we learn so you know you might your speech might have hurt someone so instead of scolding yourself and thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I've got to think before I speak, just think, whoa, you know, that is one of those extremes where I spoke too much or I spoke incorrectly and I hurt someone. And, and think of it as a learning experience. So, um, and that's what the Buddha said to his son. When you go too far, you'll know because you've hurt someone. So go back, reflect on it and think, well, I'm not going to do that again. And then you go out, you make another mistake. But the interesting thing about, which leads me to the next point, about what the Buddha said to his son was always put it past the wise. So there's a social context. You need to ask people. You need to talk to people. You need to be sensitive to people. This involves community. So being in a group is really useful for this because people can help you on that. Oh, gone too far this way. Oh gone too far that way um, and as I said I think that's what the uh, uh, the Buddha was talking about when he said um, community is a, a major part of practice that, that it helps you in this middle way um, okay so we uh, we make our ba way back to that phrase that the Buddha said where is it in the sutta and what monks is the middle way it's just the Noble Eightfold Path. So we get a real sense of ethics here. We're working with our speech, we're working with our action, we're working with our thoughts, with our views. This is, this is practice. Again, very different in his time where people were uh, trying to transcend life. The Buddha was saying, no, 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 we work with life. This is the middle way, this is the Dharma. So, um, I have a bit of trouble with it, uh, and I think a lot of people do, you know, when you think of in the, in the same paragraph, the Buddha is saying, I'm interested in the middle way, but using a word that's translated as right, right speech, right action. So I tend to translate summer as appropriate, because using the word appropriate means you can, you can still get the sense of the middle way. Okay, so appropriate view, appropriate thought, appropriate speech, appropriate action. And that opens it up to this process of um, trial and error and, and moving on a spectrum instead of going for the right one, you know, the right way to speak or the right way to think. This is more of action research, I think. 
um, of trying things out. And, you know, even something like the length of a Dharma talk, <laughs> you learn by your mistakes. You know, you do one that's too long, everyone gets bored, you know, you pick up on that. And then, you know, next time, you just make it a little bit shorter. <laughs> and sometimes you might make it a little bit too short and you left out a few important points. So, you know, maybe next time you put those points in. So even giving a Dharma talk um, involves this kind of what I'm thinking of as the middle way, you know, finding the place that's just right. And, uh, you know, I was talking to my husband about this and, uh, you know, we had quite good fun at looking at, at, at places where we do this. And in my surfing, uh, uh, because I'm a surfer, you know, I can see that sometimes even with effort, in putting way too much effort into surfing, I don't surf well. But if I don't put any effort, if I sit there and get distracted, I also don't surf well. So there's this kind of combination between um, where I'm not trying too hard, I'm just trusting my body, just trusting muscle memory, but just concentrating enough to be aware of where the other surfers are, what the wave's doing. Again, there's a critical mass at which it's too much. Yeah. And my husband, uh, he gave his example as being almost being over ardent in holding the middle way in, um, you know, uh, uh, thinking I've got to do this the middle way, I've got to do this the middle way. So, and Nagajuna uh, pointed that out is that even um, becoming ardent about emptiness or ardent about dependent arising um, can cause difficulties. So, you know, Mark said that whenever he gets kind of got to do this midway wise, even that needs to be kind of tempered, needs to be seen as, as overdoing. So I've very quickly because I, I don't agree with long Dharma talks. <laughs> I've learned from my mistakes. Um, let you know how um, the middle way has meant for me and my practice. So I'd be interested to hear about you people if you have had a similar experience with um, your meditation practice or your Dharma practice or your life. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Anna. I'm going to take the laptop round so that we can... Uh... Who wants to ask the first question? Phil, you were talking about politics on the way in this evening. <laughs> oh, no. There's an awful lot that comes to mind. Um, I'm just trying to relate it to what you've been saying, actually. But I do, I do find that um, I tend to have an inherent um, wish to seek a a more balanced approach. And I think I have an actual um, thing which is seeking balance. Mm. And um, I am wary of anything that does tend to lead to, to extremes. And uh, as Ramsey has suggested, <laughs> um, in politics, for example, things uh, I do follow it, unfortunately. And it is going crazy uh, on both ends of the political spectrum. And uh, when you get right wingers, extreme right, right wingers agreeing fundamentally with extreme left wingers, uh, this is extremely interesting to me. Uh, yes. But I'm also wondering how this can fit into to a kind of a model that you are sort of suggesting. Um, Yeah. This would fit in with, with uh, criminals in jail. I think meditation thing would be very good to cover some of this sort of uh, mode of thinking. I'll put you down here now. <laughs> well, you know, the whole thing of um, activism in, in Buddhism and engaged Buddhism is, is where a lot of people really explore this idea because you know to be a um you know to take up the buddha dharma doesn't mean that we're wishy-washy and we have to be you know mild-mannered all the time there are some times when it's very appropriate to make a stand and um engage buddhist um, buddhist activists are, are really um really experimenting around this where um you know we 
this kind of sense of the middle way is not inviting um, some kind of passivity. It's inviting experiments and um, to see what causes the least harm. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of stories about things, you know, where the Buddha, you know, I don't know, there's a Tibetan one where he um, executed the captain of a ship in order to save the, the uh, 100 people who were um, in the boat, etc., etc. So there's a lot of examples around that. And I, I think... Um, uh, taking a strong stand um, is not uh, um, is a very is a very uh, is a very important part of this experiment or this practice when it's appropriate. Mm. Um, I don't know if that's what you're talking about. It does cover some of what I was saying, but also thinking of Jesus as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, you know, and I think. This whole, this whole using life or using our experience as a way of, um, of, as the platform for becoming liberated, if you like, or decreasing difficulties is an interesting one. And I think it's an experiment. I think it's, it's a um, exploration around those poles, which, in, which includes politics. Mm. I mean, I'm going through the same at the moment with my, you know, reaction to gun laws, etc. And, you know, we have to work out where you take a stand, where... Uh, okay, so that's the pole between uh, flexibility and solidity. You know, that, that, yeah. Thank you. Any, next, next person. Anybody else have a question? Here we go. Hi. That was good. Hi. Thank you. Listening to you, I found myself thinking about uh, uh, the matter of our physical bodies. You know, one of the issues for any biological life form is it has to maintain a homeostasis. It has to avoid the dead end of, for example, uh, uh, getting too hot and dying, or getting too cold and dying, uh, 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 having too much oxygen and dying having too little oxygen and so on. Yeah. And those things are, you know, part of our part of our bodies. But yes. when you started to talk about, you know, kind of experiments and metrics. And I started thinking about uh, the experiments we can run. Some of the experiments I've been running with um, uh, exercise and with uh, uh, food intake and so on. Or we can take the example of extreme athletes. They, their bodies still have to maintain a, a certain homeostasis, but they can be uh, training themselves to um, uh, perform in extraordinary ways. Yes. Not, you could say extreme, but I, I don't want to, because I want to talk about they have to have a middle way of their body has to thrive enough, although they might yeah. be more... Um, uh, injuries and so on, um, but it's it's a certain kind of training, both maintaining homeostasis and taking uh, to pick up what you just said a strong stand for being able to perform extraordinarily in a certain kind of way. So that that is what you've just been provoking in me. Thank you, and I'd be interested in any uh, uh, comment and challenge on that line of thought. Oh, no, well, it's a good example, that whole sense of homeostasis, a good example. And, you know, the, the sense that, um, you know, through the, the, I don't know if you call it teachings, or the observations of the Buddha around the, the whole thing of emptiness and dependent arising, is that those, those poles shift. Like, the definition of a dead end, you know, you only know it when you've reached it. Mm -hmm. so, and I think, you know, extreme athletes know when they've reached it, know when they've overdone it, you know, know when they've underdone it. And it's like I was saying before, you train your sensitivities to, to know this. And I think a good coach um, does that with anyone, whether they're swimming or diving or um, skiing or whatever, is to know when you've overdone it. Yeah. You know? And to step back, and because you're not you're not going to win the gold when you've overdone it. By its very definition, it, it's it's when it's too much. 
And it's the same with underdone. That's the language to use. They talk about overtraining and yeah. the, the performance drops off. Same for undertraining, the performance drops off. Exactly. And the various indicators, like you have too many injuries. Yep. You know, it's overdoing it and so on. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the way you know you've reached the dead end is from your experience. It's not some, you know, secretive line that's there. It's from your own. And it's different in everyone. Yes. So, you know, and I can say the same about Dharma practice. You know, I thought all I had to do was sit in that hall for a month on end up until midnight and beyond, you know, meditating, meditating, meditating. You know, I learned <laughs> the hard way. It just, you know, it drives you crazy. It, it, um, you know, it didn't, it, it wasn't liberating. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've learned through my experience, which is the only way to learn. You can't have it written in a book, meditate that much and meditate that much. It, it's from your own experience, yeah. Thank you, Anna. Another question from anyone? Yeah, I was... Here we go. Hold on. This is... Hi. Freedom. I was, I was thinking about the concept of going with the flow. And um, where do you go with the flow? I mean, the flow is sort of... A multitude of presence as you flow along, isn't it? But I think, yes. listening to you, which I um, appreciate, thanks for your talk, I think it's probably a matter of uh, an awareness as to where the flow might be leading. Do you think that's, that's a way of uh, tackling that? Um, yes, and you know, it's why I brought that awareness in because. You know, I don't think this is a wishy-washy practice. I think it's a really difficult practice. And, um, you know, and to be, uh, and, and, you know, the Buddha talked about effort in these terms, is, is not just go, 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 is really is, is constantly seeing what's useful, what's not useful, what helps positive qualities, what doesn't help positive qualities. So, you know, I think, Going with the flow has to be coupled with, um, you know, a very authentic and genuine exploration of what that means. And I think that's where community comes in. I think that's where, uh, and the Buddha talked about that when, when, when he was talking in the Satipatthana Sutra of you take your awareness here, you take your awareness in all sorts of places, internally and externally. So, so you know, you're always um, taking feedback from others. You're always, um, there's a process there, a kind of a, I mean, I think I called it calibrating or moderating. There has to be a process there. So you can go with the flow, but, but constantly kind of being aware of where that leads you. And, and the two qualities I, I came up with was, you know, around harm, is this bringing harm? And then around, um, uh, uh, or we can say kindness, or and then around understanding. So sometimes you go with the flow a little bit to where you're not actually kind of learning anything or gaining anything. You're kind of wishy-washing out, and that's when you kind of come back and, and recalibrate. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, there's a lot of elements in here that prevent us from really wishy-washy into kind of slackness, yeah. Nice, thank you. Anybody else got any questions? Well, I'd just like to add to-, to Hold on, this is Hello, Phil. For the last, hi, thanks for your talk. <laughs> going with the flow, I've always found myself to be counter to going with the flow. I have this old mechanism that doesn't want to go with the flow because I don't actually think it's that helpful, that accurate, or that good for society in many cases. Right, and I'm right. Thing in that in my day-to-day -day life, we're going with the flow is creating an awful lot of uh, trouble, and particularly in the mainstream media. Phil, can you give an example of what you mean by it's not good to go with the flow? Oh well. <clears throat> I switched on the radio New Zealand this morning, and they're talking about the um, the Syrian regime, as distinct from referring to it as the Syrian government, which is democratically elected government. We spoke. We're told about the moderate rebels, which are actually terrorists. 
there is a real, there's a real, um, there's an alternative narrative going on. The story we are getting through our mainstream media is only one version of the story. Mm. Thank you. And again, that goes back to that language, which is probably in a whole other talk, that um, the power of language, of, of language kind of restricting or um, cementing our concepts. So, I mean, what you were saying then, Phil, is a good example of language. But, you know, that whether you go with the flow or don't go with the flow is yet another experiment. What happens if you're going against the flow all the time, you know, and again, that has to be coupled with a sensitivity and almost constant rechecking. To me, that's what practice is. What's happening with me now? Am I getting too hit up or am I getting more informed? You know, am I, so these questions to me are a part of practice. And yeah, yeah. And again, you've given a good example of two extremes. Mm. Questions? All questions are good questions. <laughs> or observations? Well, Anna, um, I'm going to come down here, come down to your level. I'm going to say thank you very much from us here in Wellington. We've enjoyed the past three quarters of an hour. Thank you. You've you presented us with some ideas and some uh, thoughts that we will take home and uh, consider so thank you that's been very useful oh good well again i hope it brings uh more questions than answers because uh to me that's what the buddha was inviting with this kind of um middle way is that questions are more useful than answers so um hopefully that's what i'll leave you with mm. Lovely. Well, thank you very much thank you. okay thanks you guys nice to meet you right. okay again again for some again <laughs>